have we are going to have part two part two of the session two we are going to have a general idea about brain anatomy and, and different areas in the brain so, okay we know that we have central nervous system we have peripheral nervous system we talk we have a brain which is in the head so this is the really <laughs> basic concepts that we have about about brain and, and cognitive neuroscience uh, when we talk about brain if you want to give people an idea about where where am i right now you need to give them directions and if you want to give them direction in the brain you need to have some specific terminologies for that it's exactly like when we talk about when we are in the, in the on the earth on the map you need to say okay north east south so we need to give people kind of directions and when we talk, we talk about this direction in the brain there are specific directions so we have anterior to the front posterior to the back dorsal to the top caudal to the to the kind of, uh, dorsal to the top, ventral to the down, and then we can have the, in the middle or medial part or the lateral part, okay? So we can have different, uh, different directions. Let me just bring up my pen and tell you a few kind of things about these directions. So when we have these directions, for example, when we talk about an area here, which is called dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, when we talk dorsal, it means it is on the top part of the brain. It is lateral, so it is on the lateral aspect of the brain. And it is the prefrontal, so it is pre, so it is in the front. So it is an area that we call dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Okay, dorsolateral, pre, it is dorsal lateral prefrontal. But when we talk about this area, for example, here, this part is still lateral, but it is on the lower part. So we call this part as ventrolateral prefrontal cortex. This is exactly the area that we called before as inferior frontal gyrus. So inferior frontal gyrus, we call that ventrolateral prefrontal cortex. Or when we talk about these areas in the brain in a three-dimensional way, these areas are called, these are not lateral anymore. So this is the area that is called, as you can see here, it is dorsal, but it's in the medial. So dorsal medial prefrontal cortex. Okay. So we can have different different areas, and you need to kind of learn that in a three-dimensional way. So you know that to get sure, this is the medial part. This is the lateral part. In a two-dimensional, it is hard to see the depths, but this is this part is close to us. This is far from us. So this is the the, the medial part, this is the lateral part. And then when you go inside the brain in this part, below and inside, so then you, we have ventromedial prefrontal cortex. Ventromedial prefrontal, this part is, because it's ventral, it's because down, it is in the medial, and this is VMPFC. So we, we are talking about these, these different areas and these different directions, okay? So we need to, have to clearly know these directions. If you are from the medical background, it's very easy. I mean, those who are in the medical background, we kind of, kind of use these terms a lot. But if you are from engineering side, it takes a time. It takes time. So do not worry at all. For, from, for those who are from the engineering side, it sometimes takes even several months for them to clearly understand these directions and use them in a correct way. But you need to learn them. You need to know what is medial, what is lateral, what is ventral, what is kind of dorsal, and have some other directions that you need to to know and then we have some basically planes that are, could cut the, the brain and give us slices and then we see those slices so if we cut the brain with this slice and show the slice to you people would say that is the sagittal view so this is what we call a sagittal plane okay and when you see the picture of this kind of cut in the brain they call it in the sagittal you can see the brain in the sagittal view so and when we talk about sagittal view it could start from middle and go to the to the left and right so we can we can have mid sagittal or we can have sagittal or parasagittal plane on the, on the other sides and as you can see here i can also have a, a three-dimensional axis fit into this plane so whenever we go to the front 
in this plane, it is a y-axis. When we go to this direction, to the lateral side, it is the x-direction. And when we go up, it is z-direction. Okay? So we have three directions here as well. I will tell you how this is going to be important for us in the next slides. So this is the coronal plane. And whenever we use the coronal plane, the figures that we see from the brain that are going to be in the coronal kind of way of, of slicing the brain. And we have the same kind of directions here. So whenever we have different coronal plane, we are just changing the, the, the values in the y-axis. So we are, we are moving in the y-axis. Okay? And then in the transverse plane, we are moving in the z direction. From down to up. Okay? And then with this kind of what we call an xyz coordinate system, we should be able to define for each specific area in the brain, if we define an x, y, and z values, we should be able to find that specific area. How can we do that? That is what I'm going to discuss about right now. To be able to kind of give people a, a num three numbers and just put them in the right location in the brain, we need to have a coordinate system. And uh, a famous person, a famous kind of surgeon who has made this kind of coordinate system is called Tolerock. I will kind of discuss about some, some technical details about that later on. But they made a specific kind of coordinate in the brain from what we call an anterior commissure and posterior commissure. These two points are really clear in the brain, so you can easily find them in the brain. So they, they define these, these two points, the anterior commissure and posterior commissure. And then they made a line for, for this kind of, that is connecting these two parts together as y-axis. And then a line that is just going, this is the anterior commissure part, the AC part. That would be x-axis. And when you go to this direction, it is going to be right, this one is going to be left, and then the, the numbers would be different for the x-axis. So, for example, a, a point that you have here would have an x and then a y coordinate. So you can tell, okay, if it is x and y, this is the, 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 the point in the brain. So you can define the areas in the brain based on this. And then they made another perpendicular kind of line that is going to be the Z. And if you go, this one, this point would be basically 0, 0, 0. Because this is the, the, the center of this coordinate system. Okay? And if I go from here, then the X, this is, then we are in the Y axis. So then the number in the Y would go up. So I'm like 10, 20... If I go to the back, it would be going down. So let's say minus 20, minus 30. So if you go back, and these things would be zero again. If I go up, then the Z would be changing. If I go to the left and right, then the X would be changing. So that is how the coordinate system is working. So let's, let's make an example. If you have 6, 40, and minus 14, okay? what would be the area that is representing this, this coordinate, okay? So if it is 6, so it, it is right to the 0, 0, 0 point in the coordinate system. It is 40. What does it mean when we, we say it is 40? It is in the Y. Y was the posterior anterior part, right? And 40, it means that it is in the front of part, that part. So it means that it is in the front. And minus 14, it means that it is, from that point, it is lower. So it is in the lower part. Okay? Let's see what we have here. If you put that in the Tolerock Atlas, this is what you see. This is 6, 40, 
minus 14. And that would be right medial frontal gyrus Bergman area 11. Okay. So you can find every single kind of point in this coordinate system and, and use this system for, for naming uh, areas. As you can see here, this is minus 12 because we do not have this Tolerock map for every single cut because they have made, I think it, it was something like every three millimeters in the X axis, in, in the Z axis. So they do not have every single kind of cut. So there are some numbers that you need to go to another level. Let's say going to the minus 12 or going to minus go going down to minus 15. So you do not have all the, the cuts because that is the resolution of the atlas. And different, at different atlases have different resolutions. So based on the resolution, you might not find exactly the same coordinate in the pages of that atlas. Okay? Tyler Christ has done kind of older atlas. There are some newer atlas that is called MNI, Montreal Neurological Institute Atlas, which is basically more common right now using MNI Atlas, Montreal Neurological Institute Atlas. I will show you some kind of few differences between MNI and Tarak. They are technically the same. There are some variations, and because of some technical issues, there are some, some variations, minor variations between these two atlases. Okay. Okay, now this is the link. It would be nice if people share the link because among the, the, the colleagues they have they have the link. If they sh you share it in the in the channel and the emails of people who are online right now, uh, we are going to get into this page and see how we can use this atlas together today. Okay, good. Could you share it in the chat space as well? Okay, so people can just open that. Okay, could just somebody, I mean, the, these are the X, Y, Z in Tolerac and MNI, okay? And you can see that they are almost really close to each other. There are just few changes, but we can kind of enter the values here. So would you give me the numbers that we had before? It was, how is the memory of people who are in the class? Somebody would be kind of reading the numbers for me from the course attendees? Six, okay. 14. What was that? 14. 14. 14. 14. And, and 0, 14. And minus 14. Minus, minus 14. 14. Minus 14. Is this true? 14, yeah. Yes. Okay, go. Right? Can you see that? It's in the right broad, my, right broad my area 11. Okay? You can see it here. If you want to name it, what is this part in the brain? What is the general kind of, if you want to just name this area in the brain? It is obviously, it is medial or lateral. It is medial, right? It is medial. It is medial, okay? Is this uh, dorsal or ventral? Ventral. ventral. It's ventral. So it is ventromedial and it is in the frontal area in the front part of frontal so it is ventromedial prefrontal cortex so it is located in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex okay so this area is really important in reward processing whenever you are exposed to a reward especially when you see a, a when, when you when, let's say you have a really delicious drink when you start to drink this delicious kind of drink for the first few sips that you have from the drink, you have a really high activation in ventromedial prefrontal cortex. But when you go to the next sips and when you go to the kind of end of the drink, you do not have that much activation in, the, in VMPFC. So when you are exposed to a new reward, the, that is all the reason that you have a really better feeling in the first few sips of the, of the drink, because that is making a high level of activation in ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And I mean, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex is doing many other different things as well. But these are the areas that are really important. And also for those who are psychiatrists, kind of if you go a little bit kind of down here, this is the area that we stimulate for, for depression. 
some of the kind of the, the kind of the new evidences are showing that if we put the electrode here in an area that we call subgenual anterior cingulate cortex. So we will discuss about those areas later. But these are important areas that we, we will learn. So please go ahead and play around with this kind of Tyler Rock or MNI atlas and see how this kind of this is going to work. Uh, we provided a, a, a short survey, survey for you, those who are going to do the exams, uh, do, do the survey in, in the class. Uh, my assistants would be sharing the, the link to that, that survey. So, uh, Panin, are you sharing the, 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 the link? Yeah, yes. So, I will send it right here. So, please, all of you, please click on the link that I'm sending now in the chat space and also in the Telegram group. Okay, good. So you can, you, there are some questions. It's giving you some coordinates and you are supposed to tell what is the Tolerac uh, kind of coordinate on that and then what is the, the area, what is the Broadman area of that specific coordinate. Just giving you some kind of exercises to get used to the, to the, kind of to the, the tool. This package is basically developed by a group of people in, in Yale University. There are some other resources in, in their website so you can find those results, they're doing a really nice job for that. And you have this kind of opportunity to be able to play with these kind of uh, different tools here so you can change things in the, as you can see here, this is basically changing things in the y-axis. So we have things in different levels of y-axis. This is changing things, as you can see here, in the x-axis. So it's changing just you can see the X is changing here, okay? And then you have this tool to change the things in the Z axis. So you go from, let's say, down minus 58 to minus 47, minus, so you just go from the down part of the brain to the top part. But what, if I show you this cut from the brain, this is called a, Sagittal, coronal, or axial cut? This cut. Could you tell me? You can turn on your mind. This is sagittal. What, what, what are the other answers to this, this cut? Horizontal. What are the other answers? I think axial. 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 Yeah, so axial or horizontal, is this the axial or horizontal? What about this one? This is sagittal. But, yeah, exactly. This is sagittal. And, and this one is mid-sagittal. When it is zero, this is mid-sagittal. So it is exactly in the middle of the, the, the brain. And this one is, this one is coronal. This is the coronal one. Okay. This is coronal. So coronal, coronal cuts, sagittal cuts, axial cuts. So these are different cuts. And you can play with X, Y, and Z to go into these places, and then you can find your Broadman area. So this is how you get started to, to learn different brain anatomy in a kind of modern way with digital atlases and all those resources. So I hope that if you bear with me for the next 12 sessions, over time, I, I will teach you how to use all these different resources in a modern way to be able to study the brain and have a good idea about different parts of the brain and how the, these different parts are functioning together. Okay. Anybody who has finished the, the, the exercise? Um, may I ask a question, please? Please, go ahead. Um, should we just fill the MNI part and leave the TAL part uh, empty, or what should we do with the other parts? The other part would be automatically filled based on what you do with the MNI, because you need to enter one of those, whether it is MNI or Tyler. The other would be adjusted, because at the end of the day, when I want, when I give you a coordinate. What I will give you, I will give you a number, and I will tell you it is in the Tolerac or, or MNI coordinate. And based on that, you are going to, to enter that. And the reason that, I mean, pe people provided these two different systems, because when you go to different papers, people are using different coordinates. Sometimes they use MNI, there are people who are using Tolerac. You need to know which one is being used. And technically, as you can see here, there are 
almost the same with just few millimeters off in each in each side so it is not significantly different but I mean you need to be careful that I mean these minor variations might also matter as well good and this is exactly what we do I mean when we report a paper and we want to say okay this is a specific activation that I have to report the activation you need to provide the X Y Z of the, that activation okay this is what the, this is exactly the, the tables that we are providing in the fMRI studies when we report the fMRI we report a kind of a, a fMRI result we provide you with a, a table that would have these X Y Z coordinates and when you take those X Y Z coordinates you can put them in the tolerance address to see where they are exactly and how these areas are activated in different different fMRI tasks or different fMRI paradigms okay so this is how we, we need to learn these kind of directions and, and numbers and how these things are are working when we kind of play with these things with things like kind of ventral medial prefrontal cortex dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex that is something that we use sometimes there is another term that people can use which is called let me just use my pen so it is called caudal versus rostral so these two directions would also be something that people use and I will tell you how, how this is going to work. So those who are not already confused with ventral and anterior and lateral and medial, then they can confuse you with, with caudal and rostral, which is another directional kind of way of, of saying about different areas in the brain. I will kind of use these directions as well in the next kind of discussions. But this is another thing that you might kind of need to learn. So caudal and then the rostral. And rostral means to divert your head. And this one, it means that towards your tail. So I will kind of tell you the details about those directions in the next few slides. Okay, so when you start to kind of learn about these things, you, you need to kind of to learn that brain is a kind of three-dimensional system. And you need to learn about this 3D system with some 2D images, so some two-dimensional images, and that makes things a little bit complex in terms of understanding, okay, what are the medial parts, what are the lateral parts of the brain, and that might make things a little bit complex for those who are beginners in the field. Tell me how many, of, how many, how many people have finished the, the exercise before the, the last exercise that we, we shared. Okay, I just want to kind of get sure that you are able to you kind of navigate that system and, and learn about that. That is going to be critically important for you to understand how the brain is working and how different parts of the brain are interacting with each other. Okay? So we have 50 recorded responses. 50. Oh, good. Um, and, yep. And uh, question one, and 94% of uh, participants had the right answer for question one and 98% uh, of our respondents had the right answer for question two. Apparently question three uh, had, a, 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 we had a problem with that and the right question was actually wrong. So it, that doesn't count. And for question four, 94% of our respondents had the right answer for that. And for the last question, which is question five, 73% uh, of our participants had the right uh, choice for that. And I also can tell you the name of the first rank if you want to. <laughs> uh, yeah, but we know at least those who are the first kind of the best responses. Yes, yeah, so the first person is Leonardo Velaverde Bubak Ferreri. Uh, with uh, but but most of our most of our participants had the four right answers. So, but the first Good. person who uh, filled out the form is Leonardo, and yes, most of them had the right answers for that. Perfect, so perfect, perfecto. Team. That we have. I mean, that that's interesting kind of system that is going giving us this opportunity to just 
have the results in an online and un, kind of online way. Okay, let's let's go to the kind of the, the kind of what we are going to discuss. I'm not sure how many. I'm not sure if we, today we have people from Russia or not. Do we have anybody from Russia today? Online, you can just turn on your video. Wait a second. Okay, we have Maria today here. Okay, how are you doing? Could you could you tell us some a few things about the, what we call the Russian dolls? Uh, oh, matryoshka, you mean? Uh, yeah, I mean, but, but uh -huh. do you have any Russian doll in your house right now? Uh, not actually. <laughs> okay. No, sorry. So, I can I can find some pic on internet. <laughs> Oh yeah, let me just see if I can find something on the internet. Yeah, could you explain the kind of the the kind of, if if you have anything about the kind of the background of Russian dolls? Yeah, this is kind of uh, so it's usually made from wooden and um, it's like dolls inside of dolls inside of dolls. <laughs> so and this is like smaller one um, inside of like bigger one. So. That's it. Yeah, exactly. And it's quite interesting. You open one, and there is another one inside, and then you open the other one, and there is another doll inside. And that is exactly about the brain. I think that the brain is a really good example of a Russian doll. So it just, you can see that it's just one layer, and you open one layer, and there is another structure in the kind of lower part, and then you open, and there is... So it's something like a three-dimensional way, and that is something that... So you call that Mayoreshka, right? Yeah, Matryoshka. Mm -hmm. Matryoshka, okay. Good to know that. Okay, good. Good to have somebody from Russia to give us a kind of a first-hand experience about the Russian dots. Okay, good. So let's go back to the slides. So it's exactly the, 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 the same situation. The things that you are seeing here in yellow, they are something like inner dolls. So the dolls that are in the inner part, but those uh, pinkish areas are uh, the, the larger dolls, so the, the, the outer doll. So this is the how kind of these... Uh, kind of different layers are integrated. And sometimes when you put them together, they just get really confusing because you cannot see how they are re related to each other. But we are going to learn about that. It, it's going to just take time to have a better sense about what is happening. So we need to learn about different different areas. This is what we call corpus callosum. This is the, the part of the brain which is basically dividing the brain into kind of two major parts and connecting right to the left. This is the kind of the, the major connection body in the brain. It is not the only kind of way that two sides of the brain are connected. There are some other pathways to connect to left and right side, but it is the largest one. So we call that corpus I usually write in a better way. The pen is not working really well. I just so oh my goodness. So sorry if it's just do some crazy things here. But yeah, it is it's called corpus callosum. And then some kind of really basic things, the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, occipital lobe. These are really basic kind of concepts. And then we have pons, we have medulla, we have cerebellum. These are the, the major parts of the brain. But we need to know more details. So we need to know... This is what we call the, the central sulcus. So that is the, the central sulcus of the brain. This is the kind of the, the area that is dividing the, prefront, the frontal part from the parietal part of the brain. And what we have here is the primary motor cortex, and here is the primary sensory cortex. So we call this part of the brain somatomotor cortex. Somato, because it's the, the sensory, kind of somatic sensory, it's just the, the body sensations, and then the motor system. So they are highly close to each other, and they, they talk to each other a lot, these two parts, in two sides of the central sulcus. And then we have the, what is called the sylvian sulcus, which is dividing the frontal from the temporal parts. And here we have the inferior frontal gyrus, here we have superior frontal, gy superior temporal gyrus, and in between, if you put your hand in the sylvian sulcus, on the depths of that, you have an area that is called insula cortex. 
And that is the reason that we call it insula, because it's in insulated in the uh, sylvian sulcus. So there is another cortex here, it's called insula. And we'll talk about insula and how insula is important in what we call introception. Or sometimes you can, can even say intro. Perception. So it's just perception of the internal system. So what you perceive from your body is being processed in the insular cortex that we will discuss about. So we have primary visual cortex, we have visual association areas, we have an area called Wernicke, which is help us to understand what these people are talking about. It's important for language understanding. And then here we have an area here, which is called the Broca area, which is important in expressing the language. So we have these, these so just something like a really basic kind of concepts in the brain. And here in the primary visual area, it is called Cuneus cortex, because it's something like a cone. So it is called Cuneus cortex and yeah, it is Cuneus cortex because it's really close, something like a cone. So it's something like, like this. That's called the Cuneus cortex. Then we have primary information, visual information in the Cuneus cortex. We have two secondary visual cortexes, cortices, basically. One line going to down, one line is going to up. And I will tell you why these we have two pipelines of information processing in the visual association areas. Okay, so we'll talk about these things in the next steps. Okay, so that is just, just general anatomy of what is what, what we have in different parts of the brain. I will tell you a more depth in depth kind of view about the brain. We have also some kind of uh, deeper part of the brain. We have what we call nucleus accumbens, which is on the medial part. It is very important for reward processing, nucleus accumbens. We have caudate head, which is mainly working with the nucleus accumbens. We have caudate body, which is really important for what we call habits. We have putamen, we have globus pallidus. We have thalamus, we have caudate tail. So these are the major areas that we call basal ganglia. Ganglia that are in the, the basal part of the brain. And thalamus is another kind of animal. We will talk about thalamus later on in depth. Thalamus is not basically a part of the basal ganglia. It's another kind of thing that is really important. But we have all these kind of kind of items in both right and left part of the brain. So we'll discuss about them. And then we will have we also have amygdala here, and here we have hippocampus. And amygdala is basically the gate to hippocampus. So we have to have information to the brain, to the hippocampus, amygdala is playing a significant role. And then we have thalamus here. Those basal ganglia parts that I have mentioned, they are here, they are named all together. So this is basically the globus pallidus and putamen together. This is the caudate health. This is the nucleus accumbens. So they are kind of in the same color together, okay? So learning about these, let's say, Russian dolls that are together and understand, okay, okay, this is the 10th Russian law, this is the 9th one, this is the 8th one. These are different kind of levels that are integrated to each other. It's going to be complex. It's going to take time. Do not worry at all. You will learn about these complex three-dimensional kind of systems that are interacting with each other over the time based on their function. When you learn about their function, you can easily understand how these parts are interacting with each other. It's not going to be that much complex. For example, here, when we talk about, let's say, putamen and, and caudate together, there is another really important term that people use, 
they call striatum. And why they call it striatum is another story. But they divide striatum to ventral striatum and dorsal striatum. And by ventral striatum, they mean basically nucleus accumbens, caudate head, sometimes parts from putamen. And then by dorsal striatum, they mean dorsal part of putamen and then caudate. And they say, for example, dorsal striatum is involved mainly in habit. Ventral striatum is mainly involved in reward. And then I will tell you that, I mean, this is not really a dichotomy that, okay, this is ventral, this is reward, this is habit, and that's it. We will talk that that is just something like a spectrum, that reward would be kind of sort of impulsive behaviors would go to the compulsive behavior in a spectrum way from the more ventral part of this system to the more dorsal part of the system. But it might be interesting for you when I see activations in dorsal part of the, this, this system, when, when I expose people to a stimuli related to drugs, I just feel that it, it's really hard to change that behavior because it is to the dorsal part that are more habitual. But when we have activations in the lower parts that are less habitual, they are usually easier to, to modify. So I will discuss about those details when we get to the kind of depths of these, these items. Okay. We can also check these things in the Brain Atom Atlas. If you just open your Brain Atom Atlas and go into the Brain Atom Atlas and then kind of try to use those names, Caudate, Putamen, Globus Pallidius, and see those parts in the Brain Atom Atlas, that is going to be really helpful. We are out of time today, so I'm not going to show the, what we have in the Brain Atom Atlas, but you can see and play with Brain Atom Atlas as well. Then we have another part that is called brain stem. And in brain stem, we have midbrain, pons, and medulla. And each part would have their own really important functions. One of the things that you would hear a lot in the midbrain is that there are some neurons in the midbrain that they have projections to the nucleus accumbens that I have mentioned just a few seconds ago. And these are basically neurons that are, re that are releasing dopamine. So most of the time when I see an activation in the med midbrain, it is related to a part in the midbrain that is called ventral tegmental area or VTA. So the area of in VTA is basically making dopamine in here and then releasing dopamine here. And not only here, but also to different parts of the prefrontal cortex and some other areas in the cortical areas. But nucleus accumbens is a really important area here. So when I show something to people that they have a sense of reward from that, I usually have activation in, in the brain stem, uh, in, in the brain stem, in the midbrain part. And I assume that it's related to VTA, ventral segmental area. But in midbrain, we have many other nuclei. We have those who know about neuroanatomy, they know that I mean, there are many different mid, kind of midbrain nuclei that are doing many different things, including how you kind of control the eye gaze that you have, how do you can find different areas in the environment with your eye gaze. These are the nuclei that are, that are working in the midbrain part of the brain. And pons is an important part of the brain that is connecting basically your spine and your periphery to your brain. So it is a really important connecting part. And those who have injury in the pons, in the pons area in the brain, they would have a problem that is called locked in syndrome. And locked in syndrome means that you're aware, you know what is happening around you, but you cannot move your hands, your legs, you cannot talk, you cannot interact, you cannot smile. You are just seeing people, you are aware, you know what is happening around you, your, conscious, your cognitive processing are doing their own job, but you are disconnected from anything that you can move or change. And that is a disaster. So I was just thinking, wow, if <laughs> that is a really, really bad neurological disorder because you are, you are totally disconnected from the world because 
this part of the brain is exactly the part that connects you to different kind of instruments that you have. There are just some nuclei here that are able to control your what we call vertical gaze. And sometimes kind of blinking. So some of these people can just have the vertical gaze. So they can just have their eyes up and down and just blink. And people developed instruments to help them to communicate with outside world, even type with these just two movements. And it's really, really complex. And I mean, we can have locked in syndrome with different kind of brain disorders, things like infarction or kind of a stroke in, in base, what would you call it, basal, kind of our artery could make a stroke here. So we can have lock in syndrome. Things like ALS could make lock in syndrome. So there are some other kind of disorders. And if you remember Stephen Hawkins, he had ALS and he had a kind of a, a sort of partial locked in syndrome because of the ALS. And that was something that you probably have heard about. So these are the important part of the brain. And medulla is about kind of breathing and eating and kind of sense of nausea, vomiting. Those really basic kind of vegetative states are related to medulla. So if somebody destroy your medulla, you cannot survive. I mean, without medulla, you cannot have even the vegetative state. If your medulla is working and some other parts of the brain is working, you probably have, can have vegetative state. But without medulla, I mean, you technically would be dead. 